So one comment you will often see in a quantum mechanics textbook at the end of a long problem where they solve the harmonic oscillator or they solve the infinite square well is they'll say something like you should compare this probability density with the classical probability density of the same problem and confirm they have the same overall shape. The problem with that comment is I don't know about you, but I have never seen a classical mechanics textbook that talks about probability distributions, right? Because why bother talking about probability in classical mechanics? Everything is deterministic. You don't need probabilities, but you can still define one. And yet the quantum mechanics authors expect you to not only know how to do it, but go ahead and do it in kind of intuitively because they don't explain to you how to do it. In fact, when I was in graduate school, we had an entire homework assignment on comparing classical probability distributions with quantum probability distributions. And it took us an entire week just to work out one comparison. So I would like to save you a little bit of time by walking you through how you can make such a comparison because it really is worthwhile to compare the two because you see how quantum mechanics leads to classical mechanics behavior. That it's not this chasm in between the two, but there is a bridge from one to the other as you increase in energy. The way it works out, uh, the, the probability density Right, so this roughly speaking is how likely are you to find the electron at each location x. We give that the symbol rho. It turns out that it's proportional in classical mechanics to 1 divided by the velocity. Now it might seem weird at first, but think of it this way. The electron is going to spend less time at a point in space where it's traveling faster. Right? Let me show you what this means with an example. Let's take our new friend, the harmonic oscillator potential, right? V equals negative one half k x squared, right? Uh, actually, let's write that in the quantum mechanics version just because it makes life a little bit easier. M omega squared x squared, right? So omega is root k over m. You end up with the same thing there. So in classical mechanics, we have this wonderful principle called the conservation of energy. There's a total amount of energy in the system that never changes. And that's equal to the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, plus the potential energy. I don't know why I put a negative there. 1 half m omega squared x squared. Yes, no, we're not, we're not inventing anti-springs here. Sorry about that. Um, so what I can do with that, I can solve for the velocity, right? So I can say the kinetic energy, 1 half mv squared, equals the total energy minus the potential energy. Maybe that's where I got a minus sign. 1 half m omega squared x squared. So then we just take the 2m and move it over to here, or the m over 2, move it over here. So I'll have a v squared equals a 2e divided by m. And this is why we write it this way, because then this half cancels with this half, this m cancels with this m, and I'm just left with omega squared x squared. So then when you want the absolute value of the velocity, we just take square root, square root, right? So what that means, my classical probability distribution is going to equal some number, right? There has to be some kind of normalization constant. Doesn't really matter what it is for our purposes because um, we're just looking at the shape of the graph. And that's going to be divided by this magnitude of V. So I have a 2E over M. So this is just a constant, right? This kind of gives me my maximum amount of energy per mass minus omega squared times X squared. And if you graph that, you end up with something shaped kind of like this, right? So it's minimum in the center, right? Because the electron is going to be traveling the fastest at the center. Because it's traveling the fastest at the center, it spends less time there. So if you just look at it at a random moment, you're not really keeping track of the motion. If you just look at it at a random moment, it's least likely to be here in the center. It's most likely to be here at the edges where it is turning around because it's at that edge that it momentarily comes to rest. Its velocity is zero. If the uh, velocity comes to zero, then it's got the highest probability there. And in fact, you end up with a cutoff here. Right? Because there is no probability of it being out here and no probability of it being out here because it can't, it can't go past the turning points, right? It maxes out its kinetic energy, or excuse me, it maxes out its potential energy, it exhausts all of its kinetic energy. It cannot go past that point. This is what we call the classical turning point. Well, it turns out in quantum, if you do the same problem, right, we've seen the, the 
energy eigenstates of this thing, you get a large peak right here. Let me get a better color. You get a large peak right here and a large peak right here. And you get a bunch of wiggles in here. But the important thing is those wiggles start to die down. So even though there's all this weird quantum mechanical oscillation stuff going on, and even though the particle can technically leak into the forbidden region where you're not allowed to go classically, there's peaks here where there is a peak along the classical probability distribution. And this match gets better the higher up you go. So let's take a look at how we can explore that with our code. All right, so here we're going to watch a classical harmonic oscillator. It's nice to get back to classical mechanics here, so it's going to oscillate back and forth. I've got this code set to repeat as long as it's within the first oscillation, so it will stop as soon as we get back to the beginning, as soon as one period has passed. Because what we're doing is we're collecting information down here in this graph about the probability distribution. Now, one thing I want to point out, this probability density is in what we call arbitrary units. The numbers on this axis don't really matter. I would need to normalize them, um, which I'm not going to really bother doing because it, the graph will look the same. It's just a question of what the numbers are there. So the way we're getting this probability distribution is by exactly what we saw on the board, that the probability distribution is proportional to one divided by the ball's velocity, or the magnitude of the ball's velocity, I should say. Because when it's going positive, it, when it's going left or right, it doesn't really matter. You can't have negative probability, so we have to take the magnitude of this thing. And so what we're doing, we're keeping track of the ball's location in the x and y direction, because our z-axis we're going to use for something else. I'll show you that in just a second. But basically, what we are looking at is collecting this information, so we're collecting all this into probability list, and we are plotting that here in this window along this uh, uh, set of g dots called x prob for x probability. And we're just saying when it's at this position in the x, here is 1 over the magnitude of its velocity in the x direction. And so you get the shape just like we saw back there on the board. And of course, this matches pretty well what a stationary state would do in quantum mechanics. You just have to imagine it wiggling along this, but basically going to follow this same kind of shape. Now I'm doing over here, I thought this would be interesting, would be to visually depict this along the, uh, along the ball's path. What I've done here is gone back over that list and created a set of boxes that each has a position given by the ball's position in the x direction, the ball's position in the y direction, but then the height is given by this, this probability. So I've made a little uh, adjustment here so that it appears here on a log scale, because otherwise this will just, just will jump up and this will appear too flat, so we've got this on a logarithmic scale. So this white trace here is supposed to match the red trace here on the probability graph. So you can see it's got a higher probability of being out here at the edges because that's where its velocity is slower as opposed to being in the middle where its velocity is faster. You can even see that as the video goes along, it's lower over here. This is going faster now, so the probability is lower. You have a lower probability of just randomly seeing it at one of these points. Here we slow down, probability jumps up, and now it's going to sweep back the other way. Now, of course, it sweeps back the other way. It's symmetric, so it's just redrawing all of these dots. But that's going to be important in a minute when we change this into two dimensions. Um, let's take a look, remind ourselves what this ends up looking like for the quantum mechanics version. We'll go full screen and increase the font size. And so here I've got my harmonic oscillator potential back, um, and we are going to set this... I don't think I want the coherent state anymore. Let's just get a very high N for this. Um, let's try out, uh, let me just grab this whole thing here. We'll just do copy and paste. And so what I want to pick here is a high N value. So it's got a lot of those wiggles. Let's try an N of 10. And uh, let's see, we'll get our A factor here. And let's call this one psi real zero because I'm not going to add it to anything else. Again, the N just propagates into the A and into their meat polynomial. And it'll return for us our psi real part here. We're going to run this. And so you see you end up with this overall shape. It's got a bunch of wiggles. But if you just look at the envelope around it, right, you've got a decrease here. 
right? So right at this peak is where you're going to have the classically allowed region, and then outside of that is the classically forbidden region. If we increase our window range here, let's try making this a negative 7 to 7. If we increase that, you can see how it dies off quickly here, right? So I've got this function overall, right? We're looking at the overall shape of the green where it dies off on the outside, it reaches a peak, and then it goes to a minimum on the inside. Again, there's all this wiggling going around. That's a quantum mechanical effect because if I compare this picture with this picture, right? This, maybe, maybe this graph is a little bit better here. This graph matches the overall shape, the kind of the envelope around this graph over here, this green graph over here. Let's maybe get this centered. There we go. So you've got this thing going down to zero. You've got this thing going down to zero. Here you've got absolutely nothing on the outside because it's not allowed to go out that way. Oh, wait, I can expand this, can't I? There we go. That's better. And expand this. So you see you've got this dropping off quickly. You've got this part being exactly zero outside of here. It cannot possibly go out here. For quantum mechanics, it's got a very low probability of going out here. So we've seen that before, right? This is called tunneling, where the electron can go into a region where it's classically forbidden to go. But then in the middle, we've got this kind of U shape here. Again, just kind of looking at the peaks, just looking at the overall trend. You've got this U shape in the middle here. Here for the classical distribution, you've got a U shape in the middle there. So when your textbook says to compare the quantum mechanical probability distribution with the classical mechanical probability distribution, that is the kind of comparison that they have in mind. One little follow-up here. Let me show you how this works out in multiple dimensions. So here what we're going to do is set our sphere in motion. We're going to give it a position in the x direction, so we've displaced it along the x. But we're going to give it initial velocity in the y direction so that we move in two dimensions. Let's start out with the spring force again. So you've probably seen by now what a two-dimensional spring looks like. It's going to go around in a loop. Uh, around the origin here. And you can see here I've got two probability distributions. I've got a probability distribution in the x direction, that's the red, and a probability distribution where you can find in the y direction, that's the green. You notice that they both make a u similar to what we saw before because it's really just two one-dimensional problems. But you notice that the y, the u in the y direction has to be narrower because I've got a narrower region of travel in the y. And in the x direction, it's going to be wider because they've got a wider travel in the x. And here is the cool part in my mind. Here are those squares we saw again that shows you the probability distribution. So this is the probability distribution in 2D space of where you're likely to find the ball, right? Here at these, uh, 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 at these points, this is where the ball is traveling the fastest, so you're least likely to find it there. Here at these outer points is where the ball is traveling the fastest, excuse me, it's traveling the slowest, so you're least likely to find it there. It's always hard verbally talking about inverse relationships. But I thought that was pretty cool. It's a pretty neat way to visualize this concept of a probability distribution. Again, you can think of this as if you set this ball in motion and you just looked at it at a random time, this is the probability of where you would find it at each of those points, just looking at a random moment in time. Now, of course, you can do this with any kind of force that you want. Let's turn uh, off the spring force, turn on the gravitational force. You know I love me some gravitational force animation. So here we've got the ball moving around, an invisible sun here in the middle. And you can see we get kind of a similar uh, uh, shape here. Um, you notice it's a little bit different, right? It's the, the path is not symmetric going uh, one way versus going the other way. And so we've got uh, b being farther away from the sun and close to the sun. So we've got a little bit of a bifurcation here, which is interesting. Let's see what happens when we end up with our distribution here. So here we've got our distribution. So the ball is traveling fastest. Here, when it's farther away from the sun, it's tra excuse me, it's traveling slowest when it's farther away from the sun, and it's traveling fastest when it's closer to the sun. And so you get a probability distribution where it's more likely to be out here than it is to be in here, which is pretty cool. Now, I don't have a quantum mechanics version of this yet because my code is only in one dimension right now, but would love to get it in two dimensions uh, to be able to compare this. As always, thank you so much for watching. I will see you next time. Bye-bye.